Amen. Amen. I wonder if somebody over here in the orchestra marched in the Buckeye band yesterday. Anybody? Who would it be? You? Both of you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Two of you. I'm sure that's why we had such a good day. Amen. Well, listen, remain standing. If you have a copy of the scriptures, just hold it up like this and say with me, this is my Bible. God's holy word. A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's authoritative. It's more powerful than any sharp two-edged sword. It is fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. Ready now to receive it. We're in between series. Pastor Dave just finished a series of our core values. Next week we begin a series in Revelation, the first uh, uh, three, four chapters on fire, revival from Revelation. So Pastor Dave allowed me just to preach what I wanted to preach today. So I'm going to preach from Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse uh, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mine through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is any pra anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sit together and worship together, to sing together, to rejoice in the name of Jesus. Now we pray that your word might be applicable to every heart and that the Holy Spirit will come and be the teacher today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you open your bulletin, you'll find an outline of today's Bible study notes. I want to begin with a paragraph from David Jeremiah. He said, Alexander the Great was once asked how he could sleep so soundly while constantly surrounded by danger. He replied that he lost no sleep at all. Parmesia, his faithful guard, kept watch so he could rest. If a general can sleep because a mere man is watching over him by night. How much more should we sleep knowing our eternal God is keeping watch? He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He perceives you, and I hope you sleep. Your sleep is deep and refreshing in the knowledge of it. Dr. David Jeremiah. I want to talk to you about something today that we all are familiar with, and that's stress. Does stress cause you to lose sleep? I'm sure it has. Does it affect your health? I'm sure it has. Is it possible to be stress-free? Maybe not. I remember when our oldest granddaughter was seven, and she was going through the church with her mother on a Sunday morning, and her mother admonished her because she didn't say hi to someone. Haley turned up at her mother and said, Mom, I didn't know that person, seven-year-old. Her mother said, you're the pastor's granddaughter, and there's more people that know you than you know them, so you say hi to them. Haley said at seven, it's so stressful being the pastor's granddaughter. I want to tell you, it's stressful being the pastor. And having granddaughters and grandchildren and children and all the things that we have, amen, it's stressful in this world. 
This is a stressful world. It's impossible to be stress-free. But there's a cure for stress that will allow you to be stress-free for a time until you're stressed again. And the cure is right here in Philippians chapter 4. It's sort of like a prescription that has three parts. And the first part is this. Practice praying with thanksgiving. Verse 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Pray about whatever worries you. Under A, Be thankful in everything by prayer and overcome anxiety. Anxiety, worry. They're cured by thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and anxiety cannot coexist. You can't be worried and anxious and thankful at the same time. Thanksgiving is sort of like a magic wand. Whenever something uh, stresses you out, Whenever something creates worry or fear in your life, you begin to thank God for things that he's done in your life, things that he's doing in your life. Thank him for who he is and where he is and all about him and all about the goodness of God. You begin to thank him and those fears and worries disappear. William Booth, a great founder of the Salvation Army, had a son named Bramwell. And Bramwell was, took over from his father and became the, uh, the leader of the Salvation Army, but he was always susceptible to depression. He would always fall into depression. Maybe you have that problem. It's nothing to be ashamed of. C.H. Spurgeon, the great preacher of all time, had that same problem, depression. So Bramwell fell in depression one day, and everything looked so dark and so gloomy. He seemed to have no hope. And then he wrote, I remember to give thanks. And all of a sudden, the skies opened up. My heart just was overwhelmed. And everything became so bright. And I was happy again. Thanksgiving has a way of offsetting any worry, any anxiety, any fear. We just need to be thankful. According to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, 18, it says this. It says this. Do not uh, pray without ceasing. Uh, in, rejoice every more. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. We need to learn how to do that more and more and more and more. And you know, one of the things that will help you to give thanks more and more and more is to have a good memory. Just remember what God's done for you. Remember what he's doing in your life. God is not idle. God is not silent. God is active in this world and active in our lives. And if we just have a good memory of what he's done and start giving him thanks, We'll find more and more joy and peace, and peace will guard your heart. Be thankful. Remember this under B. Be thankful he loves you, and he cares for you. You know, when you get down, discouraged, and stressed out, just be thankful that God loves you. His love is stable. It is not uh, not going and coming. It is always the same. He loves you the same whether you're perfect or imperfect, whether you sin or you don't sin. He continues to love you and just give him thanks. Jeremiah 29 and uh, 11 says, these are the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of good, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God is there thinking of you, thinking of me, always. 
to give us a future and a hope. He loves you and he cares for you. I thought the end of the world was coming when I went to the army and was going to Vietnam. I thought this couldn't be, this couldn't be worse. But I found it was the greatest time in my life because I found God's love was so uh, real and so warm in my life and so active. He had th good thoughts for me, not to do me evil, but to do me good. And before I got to Vietnam, I got this job that I had hardly expected. I certainly wasn't prepared for. I became a news reporter. I never had any training in that. But the colonel of the battalion said, I'll teach you. Really? A little private? You're going to take the time to teach me to be a journalist? How good could it get? And before we went to Vietnam, I was the colonel's boy. Every article I come up with, he tore it apart, rewrote it until I learned how to write. We got on the ship to Vietnam. I had a cush job. I was in great shape. I, I worked with the big boys, the captains, the majors, the lieutenant. I was a little private. They looked up to me and asked me how to do things. I said, really? In Vietnam, I had a private office that I shared with a captain who was a chaplain. How much better could it get? A man of God I could study the Bible with every day in Vietnam. I could go with him to chapel service. I even helped him serve communion like we did this morning. Only difference is he served real wine. First time I ever tasted it. I stuck around for the second service. I mean, how much better could it get? I couldn't think of it, but one of my friends came back from Vietnam and told my brother Jack, he said, your brother is the luckiest man in the world. Because he knew what I was doing and how well I had it in that country. It wasn't luck. It was that God loves us. He cares for you. Can you remember how he's cared for you? Can you remember some of the good things? If you can, give him thanks this morning and praise him. <laughs> give him thanks and praise. Be thankful. Remember this. Be thankful for the times... The Lord answered your prayer. Can you remember those times? I look at some of you. I look at a lot of you. I know you're pretty good. You've come a long way, baby. Amen? Look at me. You know me. You know I've been here long enough to know you. You've come a long way, baby. And it wasn't by what effort you put out. It was that God answered your prayer. Can you remember the prayers he answered? Let me help you with it. Repeat after me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. You're awful quiet. Who forgives all your sins. Heals all of your diseases. Redeems your life from destruction. Crowns your heads with loving kindness and tender mercies. He did that for you. He did that for me. Amen. <laughs> he did it for all. We need to remember the prayers that he has answered for us. So many prayers. I can't count them, but I tell you this, every year that I get to be a pastor one more year, I remember the prayers that he answers, and that's what gives me the vim and the vigor to keep going, because I know he's still a God answering, God answering prayer, and he does it for you, and he does it for me. So uh, learn to pray with gratitude. Practice that. And remember to be thankful for the times the Lord spared your life. I look at you. I know you. I've been in the hospital with you. I've been there when people gave up on you. 
I've been there when you gave up on yourself. You're here today because God spared your life. How many can say amen? amen? You were driving and fell asleep. He took over the wheel. Somebody else was driving and falling asleep coming towards you. He took over the wheel. Amen. You had cancer and you recovered. How many in this room have had cancer and have overcome it? Giving praise. I remember 2005, December the 18th. I walked into a construction zone to visit some people. They were renovating this building. I walked through the room, and the door to the outside was open. I started to go through it. Then I seen an electric heater on. You don't need an electric heater on. The doors are open, and they're tearing down the building. So being frugal, I reached down and turned the electric heater off and walked through the door. As I walked through that door, the people on top of the building were tearing down a chimney. That was brick and concrete. It weighed probably five, 600 pounds. They were rolling it toward the end and dropping it off at the door. I walked out that door, and 600 pounds of concrete came down right in front of my face. I could almost feel it on my nose. If God hadn't showed me that heater that needed to be turned off, I would have been a quadriplegic or driven into the ground dead as a doornail. God spared my life so many times. I cannot but give him thanks and pray with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving overcomes anxiety. Thanksgiving overcomes worry. Thanksgiving overcomes fear. Thanksgiving overcomes stress. And I don't want to live with stress. Do you? You can't be stress-free but you can take the medicine and find the cure, amen? The second uh, part of this uh, prescription is to practice being a positive thinker. Now, I know that Norman Vincent Peale and some of these positive thinking preachers are gone, but they certainly had something worth saying. There's so much negativism in our lives, Amen. We need to think about being a positive thinker. This is what the Bible says in verse, uh, seven, uh, verse 8. Brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything, anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Meditate on these things. Put these things in your mind. Learn to be positive and practice being positive. I heard about the fellow that had a family store and a big department store was wanting to buy him out so they could build a new department store on his uh, block. He said, no, this has been my family store for years. I won't sell. Went on for a long time. Finally, the department store built on one side of him built on the other side of him, went high, and built across the top of him. They had a sign, grand opening. He put a sign out, main entrance. <laughs> I like that, don't you? I like that. Don't you think we could do a little bit, put forth a little bit more effort to practice positive thinking. Under A, what you put in your minds determines the kind of person you are. Proverbs 23, 7 said, Whatsoever a man thinketh, so is he. Some people say you are what you eat or you are what you wear. Oh, no, you are what you think. Whatever you put in your mind is the kind of person you become. You're not going to become a positive person if you're always thinking negative junk. You're not going to be an a encouraging person if you're always full of criticism for the preacher. 
Just threw that in. It wasn't in my notes. Just threw that in. Thought you might need it. We need to learn and practice putting positive things in our mind. Look at B. Under B, some research says we tend to think 21 negative thoughts for every one positive thought. Oh, my. If that's the case, and if that's true, we are full of negativism. And we have to work real hard to turn our mind in a different direction. I want you to know this morning, I think Baptists can afford to be more positive about life, more positive about faith, more positive about family, more positive about our country. You know, I know people say our country's going to hell in a handbasket, but I just believe God's got his hands on us, and there's good things ahead for America yet. I know some of you are still... Got those 21 negative thoughts going on there. I, I was reading this week and come across these facts from scientists. They say that the average person has anywhere from 12,000 to 80,000 thoughts in their mind per day. Now, that's a big variation, 12,000 to 80,000. I suppose those that have 12,000 take more naps than those that have 80,000. Or those that have 12,000 have more hair than those that think 80,000 thoughts a day. I hear it for all the hairless men in the building. We think 12,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day. But here's the clincher. They say 80,000 or excuse me, 80% of all those thoughts that we think, 80% are negative. 80% are negative. And 95% are repetitive. In other words, they were the thoughts we thought yesterday and we're thinking the same thoughts today. The negative junk we had in our minds last week is still there today. Isn't it time we need to turn and do something different about the way we think? We need to think better of each other. We need to praise our pastors. Start with Pastor Dave. I think he's one of the greatest pastors in the world. He's preaching in Cleveland today. I want to tell you, that man has turned down more jobs since he's been here. Seems like every church in America wants Pastor Dave Early to be their pastor. I tell you, I want to lead his fan club. If you got something negative to say about Pastor Dave, say it to somebody who wants to be negative. I want to be positive, amen? I think we're going the right direction. Give him praise. That is Jesus and Pastor Dave. It's about time we change our direction and start saying good things about people instead of saying negative things about people, amen? I mean, if, you're, if you've got 80% of your thoughts negative, this... Fits all of us. Nobody's escaping this today, even this guy. Amen? Don't you just like to hear gossip, negative stuff? That's something you need to resist. That's something you need to ignore. That's something you need to refuse and deny. Under C, this is a killer. Research indicates that negativism does 10 times the damage and tears down 10 times more than what good can build up. Negativism does 10 times the damage and tears down 10 times as much as what good can build up. So here you are, a parent, and you decide, well, I've been a little tough. I'll be, good for my, I'll be good to my kid today. Well, guess what? You've already done 10 times more damage than what one little day will fix. Ouch. Well, I'll be a better 
uh, church member, guess what? You've already done 10 times the damage of what one little day or one little effort will fix. Here's a way to illustrate that. If you can't put it together in your mind, here's something to illustrate. Under one, let's say that you give a, a point to negative things. Say that for every negative thing that you say about some person, you give it 10 points. Now, just an illustration. I say something negative about Dan. I'm going to give him 10 points for that. You, you don't get to 10 points. I get it. But if I say something negative about who he is, not just what he does, but who he is, then I get 100 points for that. Wow. Say something bad about what a person does is not near as bad as saying something negative about who they are. Does that make sense? I'm saying Dan's a loser. Man, that's a lot more hurtful than saying Dan built a bad cabinet. Amen? You think that's right, Frankie? To say Frankie makes a bad coney is nothing as bad as saying Frankie is a terrible Christian. You see how that is a lot more hurtful? Now let's say, think about when we try to say something good under three. You say something good about what a person does, you get one point. Say something negative about what they do, that's ten points. Say something good about what they do, that's one point. You, under, uh, under four, you say something negative about who a person, or say something good about what a person is, who a person is, that's only ten points. Do you understand? When you're negative, it does ten times the harm that it takes ten times as long to build up what you've tore down. Do you understand why it's easier to tear a church down than it is to build a church up? We, we see churches go down all the time. It's easy to tear them down. All you got to do is say something negative about them, and they go down, down, down. And a fellow comes along, it takes years and years and years to build up. Amen? You understand why some children leave home? And never get a good start? Because you've been negative tearing them down. And when you decide to turn around and build them up and encourage them, it takes so long you don't have enough time left. We just need to practice being positive thinkers and positive speakers and positive encouragers and positive uplifters. Amen? We need to raise children with encouragement, love. Edification. We need to raise children like the little boy who said, my parents are so good to me, I'm just afraid they're going to escape. We need to be those kind of parents, amen? Can we agree that we need to come out of the negative side of life and come into the positive side of life and start practicing positive thinking and speaking and living? Give Jesus praise. Do more praise. Do more worship. Do more loving him. Amen. I'm done. I mean, I'm really done. So, number three. We need to practice making progress in our faith. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. The things which you've learned and received of me. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now as the last your care for me has flourished again. Though you have surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am. To be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both. 
to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, you've learned to me. And in verse 11, I have learned. I have learned to be content. Under A, one stress reliever is just learning to be content. You can learn this. You can learn to be content. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Being content. It's not just saying that I don't want to be ambitious and make more money. It's not saying that I don't want to be a better person. It's learning to just be content right now. Being satisfied. Being pleased. Being gratified and fulfilled with your relationship with Jesus. We need to find that peace and that place of contentment in the Lord. Under B, another stress reliever is stop thinking of yourself and start thinking of others. A lady come to a pastor and said, I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Can you help me? He said, I sure can. I want you to go and bake some cookies. And I want you to take them to all of our members that are in the hospital. Then I want you to go and buy some flowers. I want to take it all to the nursing homes and give them flowers to the people there in the nursing home. Later that day, after she'd done those things, he ran into her and he said, how's your nervous breakdown? She said, I've canceled it. <laughs> With a glow on her face. Stop thinking of yourself. Start thinking of others. And lastly, C, learn to live on your income. Don't spend more than you earn. We live in a world of plastic cards, and so many people are stressed out of their mind. They need some plastic surgery. Can we live without stress? Now we're in a stressful world. But is there a cure for stress? Absolutely. This is the prescription. You can go to a doctor, and if he gives you a prescription, it may fix everything, but it won't do anything unless you take it. I never got saved until I was in the last year of high school. And up until that time, I was stressed out of my mind. I was seeking approval. Something just, there was a itch that I couldn't scratch. I just needed approval, and I was always acting out bad behavior until I got saved and then I found peace I went in the military and it became one of the greatest uh, adventures and greatest experience in my life because I had Christ and the Bible became alive I came out of the military and went to college started teaching school did it all the year One of the teachers in high school uh, was stressed out with my stress. She was a music teacher. You can imagine why. <laughs> and when I was teaching school at Bidwell Porter in the eighth grade math class, my music teacher from high school came in. She was traveling from school to school. And somebody told her down on the ground floor, she said, you'll never believe who's upstairs teaching math. She said, who? They said, Jerry Neal. She said, you don't say. She ran up those two flights of stairs, and she was 70 to 80 years old. She, she didn't knock on the door. She burst through the door, and she stood with her hands on her hips and her mouth wide open. Couldn't say anything, just shocked out of her mind. I was at the board doing a math exercise and all of a sudden she burst out and said it's a miracle <laughs> the kids didn't know what she was talking about but I got it <laughs> hey she didn't know what kind of a miracle it was the stress I had before and the stress I give her has been gone it was cured and it can be cured today Amen. for you I don't know if you're a Christian but if you're here and you do not know Christ you need that miracle 
You need that miracle of salvation. He comes in your life. He doesn't just come in and leave all the furniture messed up. He rearranges the whole room, throws out all the dirt. Let Jesus come into your heart. Let's stand today. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for the power of God. I thank you for the goodness of God. I thank you for the glory of God. I thank you for the majesty of God. I thank you, Lord, for being a personal God and coming into our hearts. I thank you for the day, Jesus, you come into my life and turn me around and give me peace and forgive my life of sin. And I pray today that that might happen for somebody here, that somebody here might come to Christ. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, I invite you to come. We'll pray with you and give you some information to help you know for sure if you die, you go to heaven. If you'd like to come and be, be a member of our church, to be baptized, you come. If you'd like to come and be prayed for for healing or pray for your family, you come. We'll pray here in just a minute. You come right now. In Jesus' name, amen.